There we go. Um, making a few announcements that uh, Wednesday night at 7, of course, is our uh, Bible study in the book of Revelation. Of course, uh, Sunday morning at 9.45 is our uh, Bible study time for Sunday school for the adults, and 10.45 is our morning worship. We have um, you know, offering plates around uh, the church for uh, keeping our COVID compliance, so we're grateful for all of those who are able to give, and those of you who would like to mail a contribution, make the check out to Winber Assembly, Box 361, Winber PA 15963, Box 361, Wimber, um, and it's made out to Wimber Assembly. The scripture that I am looking at today is found in Exodus chapter 12, and I'm speaking about the blood being protected by the blood. Well, in the book of Exodus, we know that this is the time in which the children of Israel were um, wanting to be free. Moses has shown up, been called by God to go to Pharaoh and to declare to him to let my people go. And so we know in the first plague, of course, in the first um, encounter between Moses and Pharaoh that it didn't go so well. Um, Pharaoh just kind of laughed at it and scoffed and said, we'll just make more bricks and you know, on, so on. But as the plagues continued, uh, we find that each of those plagues um, came against one of the gods of the Egyptians. And so it was systematically just doing away with the gods of the Egyptians and how that the God of Israel was able to uh, create or bring these plagues that would just show that there was no power in the God of the Egyptians. Well, the final plague, of course, is the death of the firstborn child. In Exodus 12, verse 13 says, The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. So we have this encounter where Moses has been told that the angel of death is going to visit Egypt, the Egyptians, and everyone who has the blood of the lamb placed upon the doorpost of their home, the angel of death will pass over. And it's an extremely important that we see how that this blood put on in obedience to uh, the command of God, how that this blood was able to protect them from the angel of death. And we see that um, in, in the New Testament, the parallel, of course, is Jesus Christ and his blood shed upon the cross. And whenever we have forgiveness and we have the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin, that we no longer have death in our life. We may die physically, but we are going to live forever. And it's important that we understand that the blood of Jesus Christ is a protection. <laughs> it, is a, it is that which the evil devil himself cannot step upon. Uh, the devil can't, you know, he has to get God's permission to, uh, as it were, hinder our life. We know that uh, in the book of Job, Satan goes to God and he says, you know, I, I've... I looked at all over the earth, and, you know, there's Job down there, and he, he does pretty good, but I can't touch him because you've put a hedge about him. <laughs> you have a hedge of protection about him. And so whenever we start thinking about our life and putting together these spiritual truths that come into our life in a very real physical and spiritual manner, we need to see how that God is the one who protects us and guides us, he can build a hedge about us to keep, as it were, the enemy of our soul away. And so we find ourselves to, in, in a place where we are challenging what we know and what we think. And maybe, you know, sometimes um, we have these ideas and concepts that really aren't too biblical, but we just kind of put them together in our own mind. And we need to challenge them in a way that we are solidified our faith and that we are standing upon the rock, Christ Jesus, and the truths of, of the scriptures, and how that those truths affect how we think and feel and what we, what we do with our lives. And one of the things is to remember that when Jesus Christ has forgiven us of our sins, those sins are never to, remember, never to be remembered against us again. That they are cleansed, that we are cleansed, that it washes us, and that we are white as snow, 
you know, the prophets say, though they be red like crimson, they shall be white as wool. And so whenever the blood of Christ is applied to our life, our sins are forgiven. Our sins are wiped away. And um, our challenge is to not allow the accuser, <laughs> the enemy of our soul, to try and bring back into our lives those things in a, in a harmful way because we know the truth. The blood is our protector and the blood is our cleanser. It cleanses us and it is the blood of Jesus Christ. So God told Moses that the Israelites should mark their doorposts with the lamb's blood so that the angel of death could pass over. And so we've heard that, you know, in the Jewish uh, faith, there is the, you know, Passover in which they still celebrate this um, event that took place back in Egypt. But we also know that Jesus died on Passover, that he is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, that Jesus is that Lamb that was sacrificed for the put, as it were, whenever they would kill the lamb and take that blood and put it on the doorpost of their home to protect them from the, the um, angel of death, we have where Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God who was sacrificed for our sin. And so this, at the time of Passover, Jesus, the Lamb of God, was sacrificed on the cross, that he gave himself as a sacrifice for our sins. Well, if you can imagine the children of Israel that how carefully they would have been to follow the exact instructions that Moses would have given them. I mean, you know, you've, we've had these nine plagues prior to this, and now we're talking uh, one of the most severe plagues that could possibly come would be the death of a firstborn child. And so maybe they have a, think of a fearful anticipation that uh, how will this happen? What is the angel of death? How will it, how will it occur? Or um, are you sure that we are safe? I mean, all we have to do is put this lamb of blood around our home and on our doorposts and, and we're safe? Or then they are to, Moses also gave them the instructions to eat this meal prepared by the lamb uh, of the lamb and to standing up in anticipation of their journey that they would be leaving. So whenever we think of ourselves and how that Christ has forgiven us, that we are, we are prepared for a journey. And that can it be so simple? Can it be so easy? That, you know, putting the blood on the doorpost, allowing Christ to forgive us of our sins, can it be that easy that we would have eternal life? Don't we have to do something? Don't we have to join something? Don't we have to sign on a dotted line? No. If you confess your faults, if we confess ourselves, Jesus is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So his blood is the cleansing agent. His blood is the cleansing power of our life that sets us free from our sins and breaks the bondage of canceled sin. Sometimes we, we, we try to, we know we're forgiven, but we still feel connected to those things. Well, the blood of Jesus Christ breaks the power, breaks the power of canceled sin. The things that are forgiven, the things that God has taken away, its power no longer has a hold of you. One of the stories I use um, in forgiveness, and I'm sure many of you heard it, but to those of you who haven't, uh, I think of it in the context of forgiveness that I, I went fishing once in, um, uh, down in uh, Ocean City, Maryland, and I caught this skate, you know, it's a big flat fish, man, like a manta ray, but anyhow, I caught it and brought it in the boat, and then it swallowed the hook, and, you know, I got these long pliers my brother-in-law had, and we went down in there fishing for the hook <laughs> and tried to get it out, and finally I got it out and threw it back in the water, and I didn't know if it lived or died. Well, the, um, the, uh, an experienced fisherman told me, well, why didn't you just cut the line? He said the salt water and the acid of the stomach would have dissolved the hook. Well, forgiveness for us is cutting the line that we have the hook, but we're not going back to those sins. We're not being hauled back to the places and the times and the events of those sins, of those occurrences in our life. We're not being hauled back to the people 
and, and how that certain people have done or said or hurt us in certain ways, that we're, we're forgiving and we're allowing them to, we're, we're going on with our life and we turn them over to God. We turn our sins over to God. We turn those people over to God. We let God handle them because our future's in front of us and we're not getting reeled back in to those same old habits and same old places because the blood of the Lamb has been applied to my life and I am forgiven, never to be remembered against me again. So if they're never to be remembered, why do I try and remember them? <laughs> Why do, in certain people, certain events, certain whatever, seems to bring those things back up? Well, remember they're cut. God has taken care of them. So we have the blood of the Lamb that is placed upon our lives and it forgives us. He forgives us of our sin. And so we speak of this blood as a covering for our lives individually. But it also is collectively for our household. Pray for those in our home. Pray for our children. Pray for our grandchildren. Pray for our parents. Pray for whomever. Those who are in, you know, pray for them all. You know, pray that God that would save them and, and bring them to a, a knowledge of Jesus Christ. It's important that we find ourselves allowing the blood and the power and the authority of Jesus Christ to work in our life to break the power of cancel sin, but also that you, you would be saved and your household, you know? So it is a promise of God that he would take care of us and our families and that he would watch over and protect us. So as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So in effect, we put the blood over the doorposts of our home. <laughs> and every time family or friends and come in and out, they're, they're entering into a place where they feel, hopefully feel different. They feel that there's peace in this place. They feel that there's hope here. They feel that there's forgiveness here because they've walked, as it were, uh, through, the, through the threshold of God's blessing and presence over your home and over your life and so that God is there with you and God is comforting you and strengthening you in that very presence of God. Inhabits your home. Inhabits the place where you live and work. And so when people walk by, they sense God's presence. You know, in, in um, New Testament, the, the Peter was walking by and his shadow uh, fell on a, per, a person and, and they were healed. And so in our lives, it's like, it isn't anything that we create, it's the Holy Spirit. It's God's Spirit working in us and through us. And we're allowing, we're allowing the power of that blood, we're allowing the power of his word to just be part of who we are. We don't have to convince them. We don't have to make somebody come to faith. We just continually present Christ with our attitude and with our life and with our actions so that the presence of God is there with us. Sometimes uh, uh, we come a little short of that in our humanness, but we need to back up and remember that God is there with us. So when you accept Christ, the sacrifice, that we accept his salvation, it is a place of protection. It is a place of assurance that no weapon formed against you will prosper. No weapon formed against you will prosper. That the Lord has a place for us. He has a purpose for our life. And that he has a path that our life is to follow. And so we are allowing that to take place in our lives. David in Psalm 61, he says, um, he, he is fleeing here from Absalom, his son, and he says, God, you are my God. I search for you. Um, and I, this, I'm reading from the a, 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 a expanded version. It says, you are my God. I search for and am intent on you. I thirst for you like someone in a dry, empty weary land where there is no water. David, David has a way of, of, of talking about his relationship with God. He has a way of seeing, hearing, uh, and acting upon what his relationship with God is. And he, he feels like, you know, his aloneness that he finds himself in in this desert place 
You know, he, he, he doesn't have a friend. It speaks on later. He, he, he doesn't even have a friend that he can trust. Who do you trust whenever your son is trying to take the uh, throne away from you? Who do you put your trust in? You know, his trusted generals, some of them have defected. His trusted people that he had in his court, they, some of them have defected to the son. And so who do, you who do you trust? And so David is seeking some type of refuge, but in this refuge, he finds himself alone. And he, he speaks of this intense loneliness in the sense that he even feels that God is afar off that God is not even near him. And God, you are my God. I, I search for you. I am intent. I am longing for you. I thirst for you like someone in a dry, weary land where there is no water. I have seen you in your temple, verse, three, verse 2. I've seen you in your temple. I've seen your strength and glory. Your faithful love is better than life. So my lips praise you. By my life I will praise you. In your name I lift my hands in prayer. You see, David, he recognizes the faithfulness of God. His experiences that he has had with God in his past, from the, the shepherd boy out in the field taking care of sheep, facing the lion and the bear, you know, in his, in his experiences of aloneness out there, watching the sheep, he was able to find comfort and strength in, in knowing that God was there. And he now is an, a man who's older and perhaps um, feels that he has fulfilled his mission. Maybe he's considering, well, maybe Ab Absalom should be the king. You know, maybe he should and I should step down. But there was no stepping down. There was only being killed. And so David... He's, think, he's searching for God, and he looks back over Israel's history, and he sees how that the history of the nation of Israel, how that God called Abraham and brought him to this place, and he's remembering. He's remembering how that God protected Abraham and Sarah and gave them a child, and he's remembering how that Israel, they went down into Egypt with Joseph and took, you know, taking care of them and, and made a way for them to escape the, the famine. And then hundreds of years later, Moses comes along and leads them out. God is a way of protecting. See, sometimes when we feel lonely, we need to remind ourselves of who God is and how he is listening to our hearts and how that the blood that washes us from our sins, protects us from our enemy, protects our thoughts. You know, we spoke about that with the helmet of salvation. God, let your thoughts be my thoughts. Let your word inhabit my heart and, and, and my mind and, and, and my vocabulary and what I'm speaking. Let your ways be my ways. And he's, he's saying that God is faithful in all that he does. So as a young boy then, David, he's anointed king. Wow, what does that mean? You know, he's, if, you, if you look at that, it's like the prophet comes to the house of Jesse and says, God has told me to come here. I'm going to anoint one of your sons as, to be the next king. Bring your boys in. They didn't even get David. He was kind of forgotten by his family. He's the young, ruddy kid out watching sheep. So he's lonely again. And sometimes whenever we hit those low places in our life, all of the other low places in life just seem to pull together and come right up against this one that we're in at this, at this moment. But we have to remember how that God was able to Face, David was able to go and face Goliath, the giant that nobody else would conquer. <laughs> so remembering, he says, my lips will praise you. Hmm. God, I want to give you thanks. Even in my places of loneliness, I want to give you thanks because 
you are with me. You are my safety. You are my security. You are my peace. By my life, God was faithful to David. God was the one who watched over him. And he says, by my life, Lord, I will praise you. My actions. (laughs) In your name. The name Jehovah. I am that. (laughs) I am that. I am that provider. I am that sustainer. I am that protector. I am your desire. I am the God who will keep you and sustain you. And then we move over to Isaiah 43. And Isaiah, he was, he was also spoke, speaking of the sorrows of Israel in, in chapter 42. But God declares in spite of the failings, in spite of the shortcomings of, of Israel and their sins and their, their um, turning their back on God and their worshiping idols made of stone and, and wood, God has mercy towards them. And there's a, just a few verses here that I think just pull out that idea of God's protection and how that God is, is watching over us just as he watched over Israel. Um, verse 1, but now, in spite of the past judgments of Israel's sin, thus says the Lord, he who created you, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name, you are mine. So whenever we feel like we're alone, we feel like things are not going the way they should, Remember, I created you. I formed you. And fear not, for I have redeemed you. I brought you back. I have a place for you. Verse 2. When you pass through the waters, is he remembering? Is he remembering coming out of Egypt and going through the Red Sea? When you pass through the wilderness, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. Through the rivers, they will not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. You won't be scorched, and nor will the flame kindle upon you. So he's, you know, Isaiah is, you have sinned. You have turned your back on God. But let me tell you what God is saying. Okay? And this is the idea that the blood, the covenant that God has made with us, the agreement that God has made with us, that we belong to him. For I am, I, am, I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Verse 4. Remember, you are precious in my sight and honored. And because I love you, I will give men in return for you uh, and uh, peoples in exchange for your life. It's like the God, is, God has got this exchange going on that he's going to take care of you and he's going to watch over you. Verse 5. Fear not, for I am with you. I am that. (laughs) I am that God who is with you. I will bring your offspring from the east and gather them in from the west. How that God will watch over them and protect them and bring them in. Verse 6. I will say to the north, give up, and to the south, keep not back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Even everyone who is called by my name, whom I have created for my glory, whom I have formed, whom I have made. Bring those who's, who hear my voice, bring them to this place, bring them to where I can be their God and they can be my people. And then, verse 10, you are my witnesses, says the Lord, my servant whom I have chosen. You may know me. Believe me and remain steadfast to me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be any after me. That God has, God is the one who from the beginning formed the earth, spoke it into existence. He's the one who called upon us. And then verse 11. 
I, even I, am the Lord, and besides me there is no Savior. I have declared and have saved, and I have shown that I am God, and there was no strange and alien God among you. Meaning, there was no one else, there was no gods of wood and stone that saved you. It was I who saved you. Therefore, you are my witnesses that I am your God. And then verse 17 and 18. We find this conclusion here for, for, for me this morning is, Who brings forth the chariot and the horse, the army and the mighty warrior? They lie down together, they cannot rise. They are extinguished. They are quenched like a, a flame in a lamp. <laughs> Isaiah is letting the people know, remember, remember the crossing of the Red Sea. Pharaoh's army is chasing after them, and the Red Sea collapses upon them. They cannot rise. They are extinguished because we have this covenant relationship with God that the blood of Jesus Christ protects us from all sin, and he has this covenant of protection. No harm shall come nigh thy dwelling. Do not remember the former things. He just said that, look at the Red Sea. Look at that. But then he tells them, do not remember the former things, nor consider the things of old. Sometimes the, we and sometimes the children of Israel, they get caught up in, remember when? Remember the good old days. Remember this. Remember that. And God says, no, right now, don't remember that. Verse 19. Behold, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do not perceive and know it, and, and you will give heed to it. I even make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. I am doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Now it springs forth. I am doing a new thing. In our lives, it isn't the good old days. It is a remembering of how that God has called us. And it, it started in, in types and figures clear back with Abraham offering Isaac. But we have in Egypt the blood of the lamb on the doorpost of their homes. The angel of death passes over. It was an angel, the blood was the protection, was a protection. And we find that that protection stays with the believers and stays with us in Jesus Christ, that we receive Christ into our heart. It is the blood that keeps us safe from the enemy of our soul and that we do not need to look back over life at what was God says, I am doing a new thing. I am doing it, something that springs forth in your life. So God has plans. <laughs> God has a plan for our life. And we go forth under the banner of the cross. We go forth under the banner of the blood of Christ that has forgiven us and that we have hope for today and for our future. He who shed his blood and died on the cross and rose the third day, he lives eternally and he longs for us. He's been waiting in eternity for us to come home, but we're not going there yet. We still have a new thing that God is doing in our life, a new way that he is going to open doors and prepare for us because the blood protects. The wisdom and the knowledge of God give us understanding of where we are going, that God will look for us and protect us 10,000 fall at your side. Don't worry about it. The arrow that flies by day, don't worry about it. God will take care of us. People will look at you and see God's hand upon your life. It's not you. You couldn't have done that. It must be God. You see, the blood will never lose its power. The blood of Christ will never lose its effectiveness. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We will put that on, over our homes and over our lives. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And all who enter in and go out will know that the blood of Christ lives and the presence of God lives within us and lives in our home. And we will be free from the sin that torments us. And we will be free from those things that are so easily distracted 
for the blood will protect us. For I have chosen you. I have chosen you to be my child. I have chosen you to be the one that I will work through. And it was, it was the intent of Israel that they be the messengers of God's word. But they backed out. That's why it has fallen to the church, the believers, to those who believe in Jesus Christ. We are the messengers of God's word, that we are to hear what God is saying in the scriptures. We are to see how that God works on our behalf. We are to act upon what we know is right in the sight of God, and we walk the path of his righteousness, knowing that he goes before us and prepares a place and prepares a way for us. Amen? Amen. Amen. God, hear our prayer. Forgive us of our sins. Lord, whether we've sinned in thought, word, or deed, forgive us, O Lord. Establish our going in and our coming out. Establish our life, Lord, in the truths of your word that, God, you are doing a new thing in us, and you are doing things beyond what we could even imagine or even think. So, Lord, thank you that we can see and hear and respond to you in a way that is just about loving and forgiving, healing, restoring, about joy and peace, about being patient. God, we need your help. For these are not things we can do on our own, but Lord, it is by your spirit that we are able. So we ask, O oh Lord, for you to work in our lives, bring peace to our hearts and minds, and as for me and my house, we will serve you. The blood of Jesus Christ shall be upon the doorposts of our home. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful day. <laughs>